Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we have decided to go through the entire book of Revelation here on YouTube. So we're taking every single chapter, breaking it down into a couple of easy to read bite-sized sections. We read the first half of Revelation 16 last time. Now we're gonna read the rest of Revelation 16. This is God's wrath. God's wrath pouring out on the earth. And I would just say, if you haven't watched the one that came before this, you probably should watch that one first because it's kind of a continuing. We're reading about the various punishments that are being poured out from these angels. They have these bowls and they're uh, symbolically pouring out these punishments on the earth. And we said a lot of important things in that last one and I probably might wanna watch that one first before we get here because you might have questions about, well, why is this happening? Why is God punishing the earth? That, well, it's the end of days, right? This is the end of time, and this is the final curtain. And we have seen so far, God has infected the earth with boils. Uh, all the water sources have turned to blood. There is intense heat. People are catching fire because it's so hot. And there's also darkness. There, there's, there's nothing to see. Everyone's been blinded. And so you might say, well, you know, what about the Christians? Well, they're gone. They're gone. The only people left on earth are the people that are still in sin, the people that are still in rebellion. Verse 12 says, The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits. So we see like now demonic possession coming into world leaders, right? They go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Verse 15, behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Verse 16, and they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Okay, so what's happening? Well, all the kings of the world are coming together to go to battle, right? People are still not repenting, still not asking God for forgiveness, still not worshiping God. So they say, rather, God's doing all this stuff to us. We're going to go to war against him. A physical war on a, on a battlefield called Armageddon. Demons convince the world to fight, to physically fight God to physically go to war against him. But did you notice verse 15? It stands out out of all these verses, very shockingly different, right? Verse 15 says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. What does that mean? This is an inter interjection in the story for the reader. It's, a, it's like a warning that as the reader is reading, they snap out of reading about the future and that the, the writer is speaking directly to them. You know, it's that warning that says, you know, you know the people that go to sleep uh, at night in their underwear and then the house catches on fire and the firemen rush in and say, hey, it's time to get out. And you say, wait, I, I can't go out there. I, I don't have any clothes on. Let me put some clothes on first. The firemen always say, no, 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 no. The most important thing is your life. You get out. Don't worry about being embarrassed that you're not wearing clothes. Get out. So this passage says, hey, to save yourself the embarrassment, sleep with clothes on. In other words, be ready. You're reading about all the things that are going to take place at the end of the, t at the, end of the world. And this is the, re the writer saying to the reader, you need to be ready. You need to be ready for this. Honestly know that this is going to happen, that God is coming. Stay awake. Stay alert. So we have to ask ourselves, am I? Am I ready? This is why we have Revelation. You know, people say, why do we have this horrible, horrible book at the back of the Bible? Why do we have this scary book? To alert us, to keep us ready, to warn us. Verse 17 says, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. 
The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountain was to be found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people. And they cursed God for the plague of hail, because the plague was so severe. Remember last time in our previous video, we said that God removed the magnetosphere from the earth. That keeps things from space from hitting us. So, so that's gone. You know, the ozone layer is gone. The magnetosphere is gone. So the, the sun attacks us and then things from space are pummeling the earth. This is the final wrath. Lightning, thunder, a tremendous earthquake. God just basically dumps out the punishment bucket, right? Everything that was left inside that bucket. And the people are still fighting him, still cursing him. I hope this story is shocking. I hope it is. You say, man, this story is graphic. Okay, I hope it's graphic. I hope it's shocking. I hope you understand also that God is in the right in doing it. He is in the right. Because of all the stories that came before this. You know, you read your Bible and you have all these stories in the Old Testament, all these stories about a God who loves Israel, a God who would do anything for his bride, a God who loves, restores, watches over, cares for, takes place, takes care of, uh, sets people free from prison, a God who helps them win battles, win wars, a God who helps women have children, a God who helps men uh, rise up to be king, uh, helps helps men defeat their enemies, the God who helps men uh, get, the, get the girl, right? And then we have stories of Jesus, and Jesus uh, loves, forgives, heals, restores, breaks laws to go out of his way, to restore women, to love children, to elevate the lost. You, time and time again, you see stories of love and grace. And then you have the disciples, the story of the disciples in the book of Acts and all through the letters in the early church. And you see the early church doing the same thing. The early church continuing this same story of love and grace and forgiveness. The whole Bible is a book of love. It is a love letter from our creator. And all through it, we see stories of God providing for his people, a God who shows grace, a God who shows love. And then if you wrap all that up, and you, and you look at all those stories, you really see the length God goes to to save us. The length God goes to to show us grace. And then when you compile that onto the cross, you take all those stories and you add the cross to it, and you see the length God would go to to love you, that he would send his own son, that his son would be killed on a cross, for your sins. You know, it's, it's the thing that every parent fears. Something would happen to their children. And God allows it. God offers his child for you. So I really hope that's what's shocking. Not Revelation. The Bible. The stories of the Bible that come before Revelation. That's the shocking story. The shocking story is the lengths God will go to, to love us, to show us grace, to forgive us. That's the shocking thing. But also, the shocking thing is my reaction. My reaction to this story. My reaction to the lengths God will go to. What's my reaction to God's love? What's my reaction to God's grace? What's my reaction to all the blessings that God gives me every single day? That's also shocking. How I treat the planet, how I treat my neighbor, how I treat my enemies, that's shocking. How I allow broken relationships in my own family to exist, that's shocking. How I would allow people in my own family to not be believers, that I would not witness to them or share the gospel with them, that's shocking. How I would carry unforgiveness in my heart against a neighbor or a friend or a coworker or a sister or a brother or a father. That's shocking. The lengths God goes to 
for me. That's shocking, but my reaction to this is also shocking. Look, I should do everything in my power. I should do everything in my power to love, to heal, to restore. And you can say, well, why? Why me? Why do I have to be the one that does this? You know, they hurt me. Why do I have to be the one that goes to them? I'm always the one that goes to them. I'm always the one that does this. It's always me. Why does it have to always fall on me? Well, you know, Jesus answers that question. Jesus says in Matthew 25, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Why do we have to do it? Because Jesus does it for us. That's why. Jesus calls us to live in a shocking way. He calls us to love, to show grace, to restore, to heal, to be peacemakers, and then repeat, 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 repeat. You know, one of Jesus' own disciples even asked, what about him? Why are you making me do this? What about that guy? Jesus answered in John 21. When Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. What others do, what is that to you? How others live, how others spend their time, what is that to you? The orders from Jesus are clear. What Jesus asks of me is clear. It doesn't matter what other people do. I am supposed to follow. I am supposed to obey. Revelation warns, stay awake. Do everything you can. Focus. Be alert. Wake up. Be prepared. We have to be followers. Following Jesus. Following his example. Every day. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.